good morning. I hope you're all doing really well and I'm glad to have you back again for our final video in the series on the top 10 stories in Genesis. And I think this is number 11 or 12. That's why I'm not a mathematician, but a theologian. Today, what I want to do is do an overview of the book of Genesis and look at the stories of women. Usually when someone thinks about the story of Genesis, they think about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and then they throw Adam and Noah in for good measure. But is that really an accurate reading of Genesis, or is it just part of the tradition that's been handed down to us? Just like the male characters in Genesis, the female characters are also presented as flawed, good and bad, sometimes in a manner that doesn't present a simple understanding of who they are, but forces us to think about them and what we should learn from them. If you're new here, you're watching Caffeinated Bible, and my name is David Parrott, and for the past 20 to 30 years, I've been teaching graduate level theological studies and currently teach for Fuller Theological Seminary. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and writing on and bring it to YouTube. So if you find these videos helpful and encouraging, please do me a favor and take a moment to subscribe and give the videos a thumbs up if you like it. Plus, if you have any questions as we go through this video or ideas, throw them in the comments underneath. When I started this series on the top 10 stories in Genesis, I always planned to conclude with this video on the role of women within the story of Genesis. However, as I went through the series, my appreciation for the role they play in the overall story of Genesis grew. Until now, I really think that this one video is not enough. So having said that, let's take a tour through the book of Genesis and look at eight stories where women play a key role in shaping that narrative from creation all the way up to the 12 tribes migrating down to Egypt. Story number one, Genesis 1.27. In Genesis 1.27 it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Now the book of Genesis opens with this rather remarkable statement, especially in light of the culture of the ancient Near East. Now there's two really remarkable ideas in this verse. The first is that both men and women are created in the image of God. Both reflect something in the nature of God. Neither sex is inferior to the other. Both share in this likeness and both reflect something in the nature of God. And we need both sexes if we're going to understand the nature of God. The second is, is that God is neither male nor female. Both male and female humans are in God's image. And there's something about the sexuality of human beings that then reflects God's nature. So the book of Genesis opens up with this very egalitarian statement in 127. But as we go through, we're going to see that that doesn't hold for very long. Story number two, Eve. Eve's story deserves a great more attention than I'm going to give it right now. And mainly because I already have three videos up on this, on Genesis 2, 3, and 4, and you can take a look at them. I'll have a link to them in the description underneath this video. Now, while Adam is created first, he really plays a supporting role in this story. Eve is the one who engages with the serpent over the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God addresses her first when he confronts them about their transgression. And then once they are exiled from the garden, she starts chapter four off with the bold statement of, I have created a man with the help of, or just like God. We're not sure how that little Hebrew conjunction should be used there. With the help of is how it's normally translated, but really it could also go just like God. The one hand is a little bit more neutral, on the other hand it's a little bit more provocative. And I think when we look at the end of the story, that the provocative reading should be preferred. But what she is saying in essence is that what God did in the garden, she has now done. 
This sets the whole story of Cain and Abel off on a bad note. Now, as this chapter progresses, Eve loses her child Abel at the hand of Cain, and then she's going to lose Cain when God exercises judgment upon him and exiles him to be a wanderer over the face of the earth. At the very end of chapter four, after this tragic loss for their family, Adam and her have a third child, Seth. And this time what she says when the child is born is very different from the start of the story. In 425, it says that she called him Seth, saying that God has given me another child. And the word Seth, the name for the child, is sort of a play or a rhyme off this Hebrew verb for given, shot. In the very beginning, she named the child Cain, and that's off this idea of I have made, Cain, in Hebrew. At the very end, she names the child Seth because that rhymes with this verb to give, shot, in Hebrew. This statement of hers at the end of the chapter reflects a 180 degree change in attitude from the start of the story. The author then lets us know that after Seth's child Enosh is born, people begin to worship the Lord. Now, it's hard to miss the connection between Eve's change in attitude and the connection with the beginning of the worship of the Lord in the narrative. The author could have easily separated these two ideas, but he places them right next to each other there within a sense of each other. So you can't help but miss the connection between her change in attitude and then in the next verse, the beginning of the worship of the Lord. Now, there's a lot more to Eve's story than we can explore in this video especially how it's been interpreted through the ages. There's sort of four major trajectories of interpretation that comes off of Eve's story, and we really don't have time to dive into that now. Who knows, perhaps a future video. Let me know in the comments underneath if this is something that interests you and that you would like to see me to touch on in a future video. We gotta go on to story number three, the daughters of man and the sons of God in Genesis chapter six. In between chapter four with the story of Eve and chapter six, we have the genealogy from Adam down to Noah. And when Noah is born, his father Lamech calls out, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Instead of ending with a positive note, the lineage of man from Adam down to Noah ends with a cry for relief from the curse in Genesis 3.17. The ground is cursed because of you. In painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. So when the story turns to the daughter of man in chapter six, the reader might think, aha, if men blow it, then maybe the line of women will do better. However, by verse five, we quickly realize that the fairer sex has done no better in the book of Genesis. This time, the story is very cryptic. This time, the story is very cryptic. We have the sons of God finding the women attractive and taking any of them that they choose as their wives. And we have no idea who or what the Nephilim are. Often, they are assumed to be the offspring of the sons of God and the women. But the text really doesn't say that. It just says that they were on the earth. The only other place that they're mentioned is in Numbers 13, verse 33. In that text, we have the spies returning from scoping out the land of Israel. And these spies give a negative report back to the people. And they say that there are Nephilim or giants in the land. Now, if the Nephilim are going to get wiped out by the flood in succeeding chapters in Genesis, who are these Nephilim in chapter 13? It really appears that the spies who returned to give this bad report about Israel used a mythical reference to try and dissuade the people of Israel from advancing into the land. The reason why we interpret them as giants is because of the Greek translation of the Hebrew that was done around 200 BC. And the English Standard Version and most modern translators translate this as the Nephilim were on the earth. But the Septuagint, this Greek translation from 200 BC says there were giants on the earth. And the impact of the Greek translation is felt all the way down to this day. When the King James Bible was translated, they were heavily influenced by the Greek and the Latin translations. And even down to this day, the New King James Version and then the Message Translation both use the word giants to reflect this word Nephilim. 
but we don't know what this word means. Let's get back to our story. This short story gives us some idea of the plight of women in that culture. These sons of God took any of the women that they wanted as their wives. And the way it is phrased here lets us know that the women had no choice in this matter. Something that we're going to see played out in the other stories of women throughout the book of Genesis. Who are these sons of God? Rather than a flat-footed way of interpreting this as some sort of semi-divine beings, and most interpreters get that idea from the book of Job, where God the king is having a royal court and the sons of God come in before him. But in the Old Testament, most instances of this phrase is used to refer to kings or male members of the royal household. In the enthronement psalms in the book of Psalms, the king is often spoken as a son of God. For example, Psalm 2.7 says, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And the idea here is that when someone ascended to the throne in Israel, God would then sort of adopt them as his son. Also, given the Mesopotamian background to Genesis 1 through 11, and you can take a look at my earlier videos for that, the Epic of Gilgamesh might shed some light on this story here. When Gilgamesh became king, he would rape the women in his city on the night that they were to be wed. This infuriated the Sumerian gods, and as a result, they created a wild warrior to wage war against him for his abuse as his rights as a king. Now, this description of the sons of gods and their actions parallels sort of the story in the Epic of Gilgamesh. It also goes back to Genesis 3.6. The same sequence of words is found in Genesis 3, 6, and then our passage here in Genesis 6. They see something is good, and then they take it. And in both narratives, this stresses the transgression of the action that Eve did, and then that the sons of God do in this story. Like chapter 5, the line of women ends with tragedy as well. God is going to judge the earth. However, in this instance, the women are the passive player. It is not them who do it, but it is what is done to them. They are taken by these sons of God. This brings us to story number four, Sarah. Again, go back and see my video on Abraham's story for more of this. And this is really beginning to sound like a broken record here. I'm constantly referring back to other videos, but we got to move on quickly here. We always like to read the story of Abraham and Sarah's marriage as a good one. Long, harmonious marriage, but the text doesn't paint it that way. Their marriage really appears to be strained at several points. Abraham is 10 or so years older than her, which would have not been outside the norms then, but definitely lets us know that he is her senior. Second, we have two stories in Genesis, chapter 12 and then 20, where Abraham fears for his life because Sarah is beautiful. And in both of these instances, he tells her to lie, to say that she is his sister, not his wife. And in both instances, God has to intervene to save Sarah. Now, why does God intervene in such a dramatic matter? I think God intervenes because his promises were to be fulfilled through both Abraham and Sarah. And we learn in chapter 17 with the story of Ishmael that God clearly intended for Sarah to be the person through whom these promises were to be fulfilled. God has his eye on her and she plays a central role in God's plan for Israel. In Genesis chapter 17 verses 15 and 16, God says to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Now, the change of Sarah's name parallels that of Abraham's. Both of them are given new identities by God and play an important role in God's plan for the salvation history of the Bible. Number five. Rebecca and Isaac. We meet Rebecca when Abraham sends one of his servants back to his brother's house in Haran to secure a wife for his son Isaac. Isaac's not involved in the decision. 
And this passive stance really characterizes his role throughout the entire story. By contrast, Rebecca is portrayed as an active character. When Abraham's servant arrives in Haran, she comes out to draw water and offers this servant some to drink. And notice in 2450, when the servant asks if Rebecca can marry Isaac, her father replies, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Just like the sons of God taking whoever they want for their wives, Rebecca has little say in this marriage, and she is given by her father to Abraham's servant. After her marriage to Isaac, we see a division within the household of Isaac. Isaac loves Esau, but Rebecca loves Jacob. And her plotting and conniving and instructions to Jacob subverts Isaac's blessings so that they go to Jacob instead of Esau. And once again, I have a video on that. But the big question that I asked in that video is, how could God's blessings be subverted and redirected by means of deception and treachery? The key thing that I want to point out here in this video is that she is the mover and shaker in this story and her actions radically change the entire narrative plot and the development and how these promises of God are going to play out in the nation of Israel. This brings us to number six, Leah, Rachel, Zilpah, and Bilal, or we can entitle this Five's Company. After Jacob followed Rebekah's advice that resulted in stealing Esau's blessing, Esau then plots to kill his younger brother. So under Isaac's instructions, he is told to flee and go to Haran and find a wife for himself. And like Abraham's servant, he meets his wife Rachel when she comes out to water the sheep at the well. And we all know the story. He agrees to work for seven years for Laban to marry Rachel. But then on their wedding night, Laban sends Leah into Jacob. The deceiver is deceived. Again, notice that Leah did not have a say in this matter. Her father just brings her and sends her into Jacob on the wedding night. And I'm sure that was not something that she agreed to. Are you kidding me? Rachel is marrying him, not me. What are you doing? What do you think's going on here? And we can only feel her pain that in the morning when they wake up, Jacob doesn't rejoice over this. Rather, he goes and confronts her father and says, what is this that you've done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Laban used his own daughters as bargaining chips to obtain 14 years of labor from Jacob. Yet these two women would go on to become the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. The women in this story have no say over their bodies or their futures. Laban and Jacob make all the decisions over them. And then like the struggles between Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, the relationship between these two sisters, Rachel and Leah, is strained from the very start. Leah has children, Rachel does not. Rachel is loved by Jacob, but Leah is not. We gain a glimpse of Leah's pain when she names her first son Reuben. And the reason is, she tells us, is because God has looked on my affliction. Surely now my husband will love me. Rachel struggles as well. She begs Jacob, give me a child or I will die. And this is really ironic because it's going to be the birth of her second child, Benjamin, that's going to kill her. In 29, 31 through 30, verse 24, we have the story of Rachel and Leah's childbearing years. And in these two chapters, Leah and Rachel are the main characters. In these two chapters, the two sisters engage in a cold war to have children. The story of Reuben finding the mandrakes in Genesis 30 verses 14 through 15 is just one of the battles fought in this war. Mandrakes in that culture were considered aphrodisiacs and possibly could make one fertile. They have a hallucinogenic property that most likely gave them this reputation as well. 
And we can see that when Rachel asks Leah for some of the mandrake, Leah accuses her of trying to steal Jacob. Obviously, she saw this as an attempt by Rachel as a way to help them have a child. Leah agrees to give Rachel some of the mandrakes, and in return, Rachel says that Leah can sleep with Jacob. And as a result, Leah conceives another child in this deal, Iskahar, and Rachel is finally able to achieve a child of her own, Joseph. Rachel's plight is that when Jacob dies, if she doesn't have children, Leah or her children could cut her off and send her out as a widow to fend for herself. And the reality of this can be seen when the 10 older brothers take Joseph and sell him to the Midianite traders into slavery in Egypt. The two sisters also force their slaves to bear children for them in this arms race. Rachel made Bilal sleep with Jacob. Leah then follows suit and has her slave Zilpah bear children for her as well. And while this sibling rivalry is a foreseeable byproduct of this threesome that they're in, it's a sad situation for the sisters because neither one seems to have wanted it. Rachel may have been the object of his love, but is unable to conceive for a long time, and then she's going to die in childbirth. And as a side note, it's interesting to note that we are never told in this story that Rachel loved Jacob back. Leah is not loved, but she has the most children. In fact, she has six sons and one daughter, Dinah. That's a lot of sex for Jacob to have with a woman that the text tells us he did not love. Leah and Rachel's story is one of seeking children, heirs, and love. Yet, in the end, they are going to become the matriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. This brings us to Leah's daughter. Story number seven, Dinah. After Jacob's reunion with Esau when he returned from Haran back to Canaan, we have the tragic story of Leah's only daughter, Dinah. While this story is all about Dinah, the text all but ignores her. Her thoughts, feelings, words are completely drowned out by the male voices in the story. And in the long history of exegesis of this passage, what is interesting is the amount of attention that is given to the very start of the story. In verse one, it says, Dinah went out to see the women of the land. Instead of emphasizing and examining what she's going to go through, both Jewish and Christian interpreters through the ages have turned their attention to this opening line. In it, they think that her going out to see the women of the land was really her wanting to be seen by the pagan men of the area. She wanted to entice them. As a result, they think she is the one responsible for what happened. It's a lot like rape cases today, where the defense will often argue that the way a woman dressed or the way she behaved is the reason why she was assaulted. The second thing we need to realize as we go through this story is that this story sends very mixed messages about what happened. In the first few lines, we are told that Hamar, the prince of the Hivites, saw her he seized her, he lay with her, and he humiliated her. Now this paints a rather black and white picture of his guilt. Yet the story goes on to tell us that he was in love with her and he spoke very tenderly with her in verse 3. Then it goes on to say that his father and him negotiate her marriage to him. In 34.19 we are even told that Hamar was the most honored of all of his father's household. So this story paints two very different pictures of what could have happened. First, Dinah was actually raped by Hamar and then taken to his father's house, possibly by force. The second idea here in the text is that Dinah and Hamar could have actually developed a relationship, but because of the cultural values between the two cultures, this was something that was completely taboo. It's a lot like the honor killings in many parts of the world today. If a young woman is out too late with her friends, or especially with a male, then she is considered to have had sexual relationships with that person, and she has disgraced the family. As a result, she is often killed to cleanse the family from that shame that she has brought upon it. At its root, in both the past and the present, is the idea that the woman is the property of the family whose purity must be protected. 
not for her sake, but for the family's. And we see those same values in operation here. This is also reflected in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, where we have the two listing of the Ten Commandments. We are instructed that we should not covet your neighbor's wife or any of his other property. Basically, in the Ten Commandments, wives are viewed alongside the property of the husband, just like his house or his animals. So whether she was raped or if she had started a relationship with Hamar, which was then read as transgressing the sexual morals between the two families, Dinah has no say in this story. But also notice how the story does not lay any blame on Dinah, contrary to almost 2,000 years of interpretation. The story culminates with the sons of Jacob making a deal with Shechem, Hamar's father. If Shechem's clan gets circumcised, then they can marry and do business with Jacob's clan. And then three days after they were circumcised, Simeon and Levi attack the Hivites and kill all of the men. The other sons then come upon this desecrated city and they plunder it, taking anything of value and their livestock. Unless we miss the hypocrisy of their actions, they take the wives of the men that they have killed. They're going to do exactly what they accused Hamar of doing only many times over. In all of this, Dinah is silent. She has lost all of her honor, any hope of a future family, and will most likely be kept under close watch and key in her father's home from now on. Story number eight, Tamar. Just to repeat the Bokum record, I have a video on this as well but it's in my series on how to read biblical narratives. And I'll include a link to that video underneath this one as well. But in Genesis chapter 38, we have the story of Tamar. The basic plot structure to this is that Judah has arranged a marriage for his oldest son, Er, with Tamar, who is actually not Israeli. She is a Canaanite. But we are told that Er was a wicked man, so God put him to death. Judah then tells his second son, Onan, to raise up a family for his brother's widow, Tamar. Instead of fulfilling his obligation to raise up a family for her, Onan will sleep with her, but then spill his seed on the ground. Basically, he is sexually abusing her and violating his responsibility to raise a family for her and to look after her. So God takes him out of the picture as well. We as readers know that Tamar has been innocent and abused in all this. However, from Judah's perspective, there must be something evil about her. Two of his sons have died, and from his perspective, it's most likely because of their association with her. So he tells her to go back to his father's house until the youngest son, Selah, is old enough to marry her. But we know that he has no plans to give his youngest son to her. And she correctly guesses that when he is taking a journey up for the shearing of his sheep, he might be looking for a sex partner along the trip. So she dresses up like a prostitute and sits by the city gates and catches Judah in her plans. She then demands that he give a signet, a belt, and a staff as a pledge that he's going to pay her when he returns because he doesn't have money just then, convenient. Three months later, news breaks that she is pregnant. Her pregnancy most likely confirms her pregnancy most likely confirms his suspicions that there is something evil about this woman. So he demands that she be brought out and burnt for her immorality. Just at that moment that she asks for the signet, the belt, and the staff to be produced and asks whose these were, Judah realizes that they're his and we have a complete reversal in the story. The woman who was assumed to be the husband killer immoral and evil is now righteous and the patriarch of the family is found to be the person who has wronged her. The questionable woman is elevated above the leader of the family. Tamar's story is a tragic one as well, but in her struggle for survival, we see her using her cunning creativity and sexuality, the only assets that she possessed, to save herself. In the end, we know that she ends up being one of the four women mentioned in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus 
as Judah says in this story, she is more righteous than I am. This brings us to Potiphar's wife, Sur the anti-Tamar. Immediately after Tamar's story, the author jumps back to the story of Joseph. Joseph has been sold as a slave into Egypt in Genesis chapter 39, and he ends up being purchased and serving in Potiphar's house. Now, if Tamar is an innocent woman abused by Judah's family, Potiphar's wife represents the flip side of the coin. In 39.6, we are told that Joseph is basically the ancient equivalent of the model Fabio from the 1980s and 90s. I guess that kind of really dates me, doesn't it? He attracts the attention of Potiphar's wife, and day after day as he's working in the house, she comes along and demands, come to bed with me. While Tamar proved her innocence by producing Judah's garments, the belt, the signet, and the staff, Potiphar's wife will use Joseph's garment against him to prove his guilt. Tamar's actions reversed the injustices that have happened to her and saved her from possibly being burned alive. Potiphar's wife only acts for her own desires and causes the imprisonment and the injustice of Joseph. So you see how these different women play off each other throughout the book of Genesis, but they also play off the male characters. To keep a long story sort of short, let me summarize. First, this video does not do justice to the lives and the story of the women in the book of Genesis. I fully realize that, but I hope it does a couple things though. I hope it opens your eyes to the book of Genesis that is not just structured around the stories of men, but sheds almost equal attention to the women as well something that is truly unusual in the ancient Near Eastern texts. Second, I hope that in some small way, this video might serve as an encouragement to someone else to work on these stories and develop this more. And third, like the men in Genesis, the women are presented in all of their strengths and weaknesses. But unlike the men, we learn a great deal about how they were treated, their plight in that culture and their time yet they acted with creativity, daring, tenacity, and faith in many of their situations. If you found this video informative, please do me a favor and take a minute to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below if you have a question or if one of the stories of these women really strikes you in a particular way, leave a question or a comment about it. I'd love to hear what you're thinking as well. Until next week, I'll leave you with the word of peace.